I think it's fair to say that our society loves heroes. We always look for heroes. We want people to put up on a pedestal. We want people that we can sit there and look to and say that they represent the good of society, the good of humanity, and all that other crap. But honestly, what we really love to do is to build up our heroes so that way we can knock them down a couple pegs and we can tear them down and we can destroy them and we can get off in some sick, sadistic fashion over watching them squirm and watching them struggle and watching them go through crap. It's like it's our way to connect with them. We want to aspire to be like them, but we enjoy even more sitting there and knocking them down a couple of pegs and tearing them down and trying to destroy them. It's that love of negativity that I think we have as a species. We gravitate to this crap, and you see this play out all the time in society. We build them up just to tear them back down, and then what do we love the most? We love that great redemption story. He was there, and then it wasn't, and now he's back again, and everybody can feel good about the journey along the way and all this other crap. And I think that's very true. Now, when it comes to Hulk Hogan and the release of these racist remarks that were part of a sex tape made several years back, it kind of proves that point in a way. With all the things that are going on in our society, with all the things and problems that we have in this country alone, we seem as fixated, if not more so, on the happenings of a 60-plus-year-old white male and what comes out of his diarrhea hole than we are with trying to stop domestic violence, stop gun violence, solve black-on-black -black crime, uh, solve inequality and inadequacy of education, um, all of these different things. It's a sad indictment of our society when we're focused on tearing down people for stuff like this. Now, with that said, a lot of times when it comes to the tearing down of individuals, our heroes, if you will, they deserve to be torn down because they do it to themselves. And when you do certain types of stupid shit, there's just not a whole lot of defense that you can put out there. And frankly, from a Hulk Hogan standpoint, I'm not necessarily sure that this is something that he can ever recover from. And it's sad to me. It's very sad, but I'll talk more about that in a little bit. It's sad, but it's really, frankly, not all that surprising. And there are a lot of reasons for that. First, I look at Hulk Hogan himself. Yes, he's my favorite wrestler of all time, and that's not going to change just because of this. He is somebody that made me a fan of professional wrestling, kept me a fan of professional wrestling, and I'm not going to forget about that and you know, try to overlook that. It is who I am. He is a representation of that. But this is also the same Hogan that I've looked up to for so many years and admired in many ways for so many years and was a huge fan of and supporter of for so many years and to a degree still am. I've always known that he's a very, very flawed individual. I mean, I've never had any delusions about this guy being the patron saint of humanity or professional wrestling or Jesus Christ in red and yellow. I mean, this is a guy that for years lied about his steroid use and still, frankly, has never owned up to it to the level that he should have and spoken of the evils and dangers of it to the level that he nearly should have. This is also a guy that's known as a legendary drug user, marijuana, and other types of booger sugar goodies, and again, never really has owned up to that. I mean, so we're talking about a guy who has a history of habitually lying, you know, the whole Metallica crap, and so on and so forth, or this, or that, or every damn thing else. It seems like every time Hogan opens up his mouth, I'm waiting to hear the next lie come out of it. And you know, in a way, that's a bit of a product of his environment for so many years in terms of being in the professional wrestling business. And we don't call him Terry Bollea. We call him by his character name, Hulk Hogan. He lives via the character name of Hulk Hogan, not Terry Bollea. So he is that lie. He lives that lie every single day. And when your entire life is a lie, basically, for so many years acting as if professional wrestling wasn't scripted, fake, 
entertainment, predetermined outcomes and all that crap. Sometimes it's hard to distinguish between fact and fiction. And again, when you compile that along with the fact that for so many years he lied about steroid use, he's still lying about it to a degree, lied about his drug use, I, I shouldn't be that surprised that he would say something like this. I mean, this is the same guy, mind you, that fucked his best friend's wife. I mean, seriously. Again, a patron saint of professional wrestling, Jesus Christ in red and yellow, Hulk Hogan never has been and most certainly never will be. But what's really sad about this whole incident and this whole matter is that Hulk Hogan in a lot of ways is a reflection of America and in particular of white society. And this is true. Hogan's views in a lot of ways are a product of his lifetime. I mean, when you think about it, Hogan's in his 60s. He grew up in the South. He grew up at a time when segregation was still legal. You had state-sanctioned racism and racial oppression and subjugation. No matter what anybody wants to say about it, that plays a role. Because you can look at let's say, me being 34, I can look at my parents' and my grandparents' generation and see the reality that they lived and compare it to the reality that I've lived, and they're basically two totally, entirely different worlds. But it's not hard to see why somebody like a Hulk Hogan would have these types of views and think that type of way and say those types of things because you can only imagine the environment that he grew up in. Now, at the end of the day, that's not an excuse to justify what is said. Because stupid shit is stupid shit. But, at some point in time, that background, that you know, childhood, that environment, can play a role. I mean, it really can. You're talking about old people that have had ingrained them for so many years an old school way of thinking. Now, in terms of what he said, you know, he, here's the thing. A lot of the white people that are going to be angry about this have thought or said the same things themselves, either to themselves or to others out loud and sometimes proudly because they don't care. Now, this is also not something that is unique to white people and white parents or white families as well. There are plenty of other blacks and Asians and Hispanics that view things similarly. And again, in a lot of ways, when we talk about our parents and our grandparents' generation, it comes back to the environment in which they were raised. You know, frankly, if I'm looking at somebody that's black or Hispanic or over the age of 60, especially black, you know, I can sit there and say at some point in time, you got to let it go. You can't always have that ax to grind. I also didn't live their reality. I also didn't live their life. I also didn't grow up in the time that they did, where at one point in time, even to a certain degree now it's still true, but back then you had laws on the books in areas of this country where it said it is okay to treat you as inferior because of the pigment of your skin. So are there plenty of black parents that don't want their children dating whites or dating Asians or Hispanics? Well, I can tell you from personal experience, that is most certainly the case. This is not a unique phenomenon to one race or one group of people. It is a larger problem representative of the environment that previous generations lived. And in a lot of ways, while people can sit there and pretend to be outraged about this and talk about how terrible this is, we know deep down that a lot of us in society hold some of those similar views. We don't always want to talk about them. We all might want to try to sweep them under the rug. We might try to ignore them and play them off, but it's true. And I put it equivalent to having a disappointment finding out that your child is gay. Whether it's a son, whether it's a daughter, what have you. Parents sit there and they'll look and say, my kid is going to be ostracized. What did I do wrong? I didn't raise them to be that way. Why did they choose to be that way? But then they also think about it from the standpoint of it's awkward, it's uncomfortable, it's not something that 
that they grew up with. It's not something that was a part of their reality. Furthermore, they also look at it too. Frankly, parents look at it from a grandparent standpoint. You know, they sit there and see their son is gay and they think they're never having any grandbabies. Or if their daughter is a lesbian, that they're never having any grandbabies. So it ends up being a natural disappointment. You know, and, and for guys, I'll put it out there this way. When you go to the club and you see a hot woman and you find out she's a lesbian, but you find out she's the lesbian that won't let you either watch her have sex with another woman or participate in a three-way, you're disappointed, and we know that we say it, gentlemen. We know that we say it, whether we want to admit it or not. We will sit there and say, damn, that's a shame that she doesn't like dick. Damn, that's a shame because I turn her back to the good side. Damn, this and that, everything else. So again, what Hulk Hogan said was terrible, and what Hulk Hogan said is a representation of his reality, of his environment, of our society as a whole. But he's not unique in this, and he most certainly isn't the only one that feels this way. We find different ways to have these types of views about different things. And again, when it comes to certain things, I'll at least have the courage to admit that there are times where I've thought those things. You know, while I'm a huge supporter of equality of marriage for all, while I'm a huge supporter of equal rights for all, not just when it's convenient, but equal truly across the board, there are times where I've had those thoughts. There are times where I've wanted to say those things. Maybe my muffler is better. Maybe I think before I speak, and Hulk Hogan did not. I don't know. But I think if we're being honest with ourselves, as people, all of us have some type of thought like that. All of us have some type of belief like that. Whether it's pounded into us by society, whether it's something that we've developed based off of our life experiences, it's there and it's real. It's very, very real. And you know, I look at this too. Again, we're talking about a society where we still have people to this day that defend the good old stars and bars as a symbol of Southern pride and heritage. No, it's a symbol of racism and racial oppression and subjugation of an entire race of people for hundreds of years. It was used as a defense mechanism to protect Jim Crow segregation. And if you want to say about the Civil War, while it was never the full-on flag for the Confederate States of America, it was flown in battle by the armies of Northern Virginia. It was a part of the Confederate flag, a flag that was to represent the South, a treasonous state, who broke off from the North to protect the institution of slavery. And all this pro-South revisionist history that we've seen in our history books and what have you over the past 150 years, all this Civil War guilt that there is in this country doesn't change the fact that the stars and bars are a symbol of racism and racial tyranny, racial oppression and subjugation. I mean, we can't be surprised that people like Hulk Hogan would say these types of things when we've got whack jobs and idiots still defending the stars and bars like this is something to defend. It belongs in a museum. Not flying out in front of the fucking courthouse or statehouse. But again, when you look at somebody like Hulk Hogan, it's also not surprising to see somebody like him have the viewpoints that he does. And a lot of us, most of us, if not all of us, having them in some way, shape, or form because when we look at our society, when we in particular look at our media, how could you not? Look at the difference in media portrayals of whites versus non-whites. Look at that recent shooting in Louisiana. You go, let's say, on Yahoo front page or something, and they show a picture of the victims. And it's the best possible light they can shine on the victims. It's the best possible picture. It just puts off this image that this is sad and this is tragic and that's two white people that the world no longer has and it is sad and it's tragic it's not tragic because they're white it's tragic because they were gunned down by a fucking terrorist lunatic it's tragic because their families will no longer have their daughters their mothers their sisters their aunts whatever that's why it's tragic but then when you look at the case of, let's say, Sandra Bland, 
Right next to the picture of the two white girls in the best possible light, there's a picture of Sandra Bland and her freaking mugshot, shining her in the worst possible light, putting that thought into your mind that, oh, well, she was a criminal anyways. Oh, she was this anyways. That's no great loss on society. What? You know, we don't even know whether it was suicide or something else. And something leads me to believe that it might have been more than just suicide. But even if that's the case, why is her loss of life any less tragic than their loss of life? In part knowing as well that she was arrested, frankly, for ridiculous reasons, was a victim of our police state where there is a problem in terms of racism, but racism alone is not the only problem with the police and the people that think that that is the only issue need to wake the fuck up. It's not the only problem. Yes, in some ways it does disproportionately affect blacks and in particular black males and Hispanics. I do not deny that. That is true. But it is a representation of the police state of America. It is a representation of our police as a whole and the institution, forgetting that they're supposed to protect us. They are supposed to work for us. We are not to be their slaves. We are not to be subjugated by them. We are not to sit there and be viewed as second-class citizens by them. But you wouldn't know that if you look at the media because Sandra Bland's picture is being posted all over the place and it's a freaking mugshot. But these Louisiana shooting victims, we make sure we portray them as pearly white as we possibly can. And you look at it from a greater standpoint. The dude that did the school shootings in Newtown, Connecticut. The dude that went nutsos in Aurora, Colorado. You know, you go back to uh, Dylan Klebold and Eric Harris and the Columbine shooting. You look at Dylan Roof. Everything always comes back when it's a white perpetrator to the gun control issue and mental health. And you look at the Louisiana shooter, or wouldn't you fucking know? We're not talking about this. We're not talking about him being a terrorist. We're talking about his mental health problems and his history of them. You ever notice that? When a guy like the Boston Bomber does his thing, he's a terrorist. When somebody goes shoot up, shooting up a naval recruiting office, they're a terrorist. Now, imagine that. They happen to look Muslim. So we portray them as terrorists. Dylan Roof goes into a church of all freaking places and kills nine people. We're talking about gun control and we're talking about mental health. Some other guy goes shoots up 20 plus little kids at a freaking elementary school. And again, we're talking about gun control and the gun issue. And we're talking about mental health. At no point in time are we calling these people for what they really are. Terrorists. And you see this play out all the time. Who are the real terrorists here? If Sarnev's a terrorist, if the guy that did the shooting at the naval office is a terrorist, well, what the hell does that make Dylan Roof or what's his name? Was it the Lanza kid, whatever the hell his name was? Uh, John Holmes, Cleveland, Harris, any other number of school shooters. Remember when the guy went up and shot up the Amish school? We talked about gun control. We talked about mental health issues. We did everything as a media, as a society, other than call them what they really were, fucking terrorists. And you see this in our society. White people carrying around freaking AK-47s and stuff. Well, that's funny, but they're idiots because they did, 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 did. You see somebody with darker pigment walking down the street with a hijab, and we're being programmed to watch suspicious people who are acting funny. I'm just saying. So all this media that's going to be trying to capitalize upon this, all this media that is going to try and cash in on this, all of this media that's going to try and create some narrative, shame on you and fuck you. Because you've created this environment, you've created this society rife with double standards, and you see this play out every day in the way instances are portrayed. Let Michael Brown have been a white guy. They would have never even shown any clip of him at a convenience store trying to rough up a dude or rob anything. Just imagine, think about it.
But again, when we come down to racism and what's happened with Hulk Hogan, it's really about the racism within our society. You know, our environment in our society, as I feel like I've explained very, very well, creates this, manufactures this, puts out this propaganda in a way that, frankly, at some point in time, whether you realize it or not, you become a product of the system. You become ultimately a tool and a delivery device for the system. And while we can sit there and try and pat ourselves on the back and talk about how great things are as a society, and in this country, yeah, race relations in 2015 are a whole hell of a lot better than they were in 1965 or 55. What the fuck is that saying? It's like you take a test the first time and you get a zero. I mean, you just ass out, bust, fail every fucking thing. That's American race relations for so many years throughout our country's history. Okay, then over the fat past 50 years, there have been positive things that happened. Some things have changed, but a lot of things have not ultimately. Now we've gone from a zero on the score to probably more in the 30s or 40s. Well, fuck, based off of the measurement of being a complete fucking zero, the 30s and 40s looks like a dramatic market improvement. In a lot of ways it is. But if we go over... It based off of an old, let's say, uh, grading scale for school, you're still fucking failing, and you're not even close to passing. We could try and make ourselves feel better, and we can talk about how much better things are. That's true, but at the end of the day, what the fuck is that really saying? It's more of an indictment of where we were as a society, and more of a statement of how far we still have to go. And you look at entertainment, and their role in perpetuating stereotypes, they're just as guilty, if not more so, than the white versus black media portrayals. It's not a surprise, again, that Hulk Hogan is going to say things like that and think things like that if for 20-plus years the only rap artists, let's say, that you ever hear about or ever talked about are the ones that are sagging their fucking pants, using the N-word, and saying all types of stupid shit all the while, can't seem to put together two coherent sentences to save their fucking life. Never mind all the other black artists that are educated, that do sound intelligent, that don't act like idiots, that don't dress like jackasses. You don't hear about them from the media. Social media world doesn't gravitate to them. They don't promote them. They promote the idiots. They promote the exceptions. And that exception eventually becomes the norm, and it becomes the reality. Entertainment still to this day portrays white people in a certain way, non-white peoples in other ways. So for the entertainment industry, who I'm sure plenty of people are going to have all types of things to say about Hulk Hogan and what he said, look yourself in the fucking mirror and ask yourself what you're doing to make this possible. Ask yourself what you're doing to help perpetuate these types of racist and prejudicial stereotypes. And frankly, here's the conflict in it, is that I know a lot of wrestling fans are going to pretend like they're all outraged and up in arms about this, but I can tell you as a wrestling fan for 30 years, some of the worst things I've ever heard from a racist standpoint have come out of the mouths of wrestling fans, it's true. And there are a lot of people that are going to seize upon this as an opportunity to knock Hulk Hogan. All the while, they would have no problem dropping the N-word themselves, have done it, do do it, and will continue to do it going forward, or just say other racist, ignorant fucking things. I mean, it's true. The history of equality in the wrestling community, both in the business and among the fan base, not very good. Not very good at all. So, in a lot of ways, again, Paul Kogan, living in that environment, being a part of that reality for so many years, it's not a surprise to see him be like that. But here's where the conflict comes in. Do you automatically shun the guy? Do you automatically sit there and say he's not worthy, he's no good, he's this, he's that, and everything else? Knowing damn good and well, you've had many co-workers, friends, family members, uh, significant others, that have probably said and done incredibly prejudiced or outright racist shit throughout the years. I know I can speak 
as a white man that lives with a black woman, has dated black women for his entire life, but just as a white man as well, as a whole, I've had a lot of coworkers, friends, and family say a lot of stupid, prejudicial, racist ass fucking things over the years. It's a reality. I can remember working at Foot Locker back in the day and how many times I'd be the only white employee in the store on that particular day and the white people would gravitate to me and then they would sit there and say just these incredibly ignorant fucking things and they would expect me to agree like they were looking to me for validation for the shit that they were saying and I assure you they got none of it and more often time it was no Air Force One for you. And it happens a lot. I can remember a particular case where one time there was an older white woman, probably in her late 60s, early 70s. Somehow we got on the conversation of Elvis. I don't know something white people talk about sometimes, okay? And then at some point in time, she said something to the effect of he must be rolling over at his grave at the thought of his daughter marrying. You can fill in the six-letter N-word that is not nagger, okay? To which I responded, I can only imagine what Joe and Catherine must think at the thought of their son dating a spoiled rich bat and brat entitled whore. People say these types of things all the time. I've heard friends, people even that I still consider friends, say racist stuff all the time. But I've heard it from my family, too. You know, I've had members of my family express disappointment at me for dating outside of my race and talk about how they don't agree with it and sit there and say that it's wrong and it's bad. Are they no longer family because they say those things? No. Do I stop loving them as family because they say and do stupid things like that? No. It changes my perspective on them. I might not feel quite the same way about them. It might be something that I harbor a lingering resentment towards them for. But it doesn't mean they stop being friends either. It doesn't mean they stop being family either. In part, I feel it's important to sit there and be a presence in those people's lives if and when possible because in part, it's my job, I feel, to educate them. It is my job to break them of those bad habits. It's my job to sit there and show them how ignorant their views really are. And that's the whole thing. Now, in terms of this whole situation overall, I give Gawker a lot of credit. You've got that big, massive lawsuit with Hulk Hogan. Their end game here was brilliant. They have completely discredited Hulk Hogan. They have drug him through the mud. They have blackmailed this man brilliantly. Uh, it's almost checkmate Gawker. I mean, they played it, and they played it br brilliantly. From Hulk Hogan's standpoint, it's really hard to recover from something like this. Ask Michael Richards. Ask Paula Dean. Ask Mel Gibson. You know, two of the worst things that you could ever be accused of in this society both begin with the letter R. That's a rapist and a racist. And our media and our society, even though we help perpetuate these stereotypes, frankly enjoy these stereotypes and advancing these stereotypes and advancing these viewpoints and these ideologies and these thought processes. We try to scrub ourselves of that guilt by sitting there and basically, for a better term, uh, blackball. See, why can't it be whiteball? Why can't it be whitelisting? It's got to be blackball or blacklisting. But you get what I'm saying. We basically shun them, we turn our backs on them, and we never allow them a real chance of redemption. We never sit there and say, this is a mistake, they need to learn. Instead of taking this and using this as an educational piece to help improve our society for the greater good, the media will just sit there and capitalize upon this, trying to cash in on the sensationalism of this crap, and then we will destroy these people, and that's that. And from Hogan's standpoint, no matter whether it's a Dennis Rodman having the courage to stand up for him or others that happen to be black or non-white that will stand up for him and probably will be more, it's really going to be hard for Hogan to recover from this. And the sad thing about it is, is that this should be yet another example of something that should start a serious, necessary discussion in this country and our society as a whole, but ultimately it won't. 
in our social media society with our short attention spans and our lack of real purpose or conviction in anything. It's this sensationalism and negativity bullshit that we feed off of that will continue to drive us. So nothing will happen. No positive change will come out of this. It's one thing for something bad to happen, but what can we learn from it? How can we grow from it as a people? How can we be better for it? There is no end game here. There is no getting better from this. There is no learning from this. There's no improving from this. Your friends and family that have said racist shit before probably are still going to say it. The wrestling community, both the fans and the freaking business itself, are going to continue to be just as racist as they always have been. Our society and our media are going to continue to perpetuate this cycle of inequality in the way that whites and blacks and other non-whites are portrayed. I mean, it's a shame and it's disappointing to me on so many different levels. Uh, as a man who sits there and, you know, tries to pride myself as much as possible on, you know, being a champion for others and, you know, being about equality for all, justice for all, if you will, you know, and, you know, being somebody that lives in a situation where I deal with still funny looks all the time and I hear the mumblings and the murmurs all the time and everything else. It's really, it's really heartbreaking to me in a way to hear somebody like Hulk Hogan, somebody that's been such an important part of my life for so many years that in many ways has helped shape who I've become at this stage of my life in many ways. Um, somebody that I've looked to, somebody that I've admired, somebody that I've respected, somebody that I love for so long, say something like this. It hurts as if it was my own dad that said it. It hurts as if it was my own mom that said it. It hurts as if my own family said it or my friends said it. It hurts me that much. It really does. I hurt for him. I hurt for me. Because I know that, again, there's no real good that's going to come out of this, only bad. And Hogan's never going to really recover from this. And frankly, I honestly don't care if he ever recovers from this or not. Because at some point in time, you have to be accountable for the shit you say and the shit you do. Um, you know, and again, it's really sad. I'm still not going to turn my back on Hogan in the sense of pretend like he never existed and <clears throat> WWE. I'm not going to sit there and allow this to totally erase all the positive memories I have of Hulk Hogan and being a fan of his for so many years. But the shameful thing is, is this is a major significant stain on his legacy. Because when all is said and done, when you see the obituaries written and we talk about his legacy, this is going to be multiple paragraphs. It may not be the first paragraph, but it's going to be its own entire page. And that's a shame and that's really sad. Like one thing this whole situation bears out to be true is that honestly, the less you know about your heroes, the better off it is for all parties involved. And that's really a shame. What Hulk Hogan said didn't surprise me, but it doesn't mean it doesn't disgust me either. I would have hoped that he wouldn't have been about that. I would have hoped that he would have been better than that. Like I said, people, the less you know about your heroes, the better off you are. 